Good evening, good afternoon everyone. Today we are looking at Rust and how it supports object-oriented programming. It's worth mentioning that Rust is not object-oriented language. It's also not a functional language. It's somewhere in between. It's not a hero of both or neither of those. It's a, it's a little bit unique actually. But we do have some functionality that can support object-oriented programming, so let's focus on that today. And let's start with the basics. Well, there are no objects in Rust. What we do have in Rust are structures. And those structures pretty much represent the same thing as an object, especially since you can glue some functions to them and use them as methods. Very basic example, we've got a public struct called shape with the public field called name. We also implemented one function or rather one method. So how do we use it? We create a new variable and then we instantiate that structure and we need to fill in all of the fields. In this notation with, with a simple dot, we can use methods how does it look in practice? This is a basic drawing of circle, because this is the name that we gave to it. Now let's move on to the next step, which is encapsulation. What we have in here is a very similar structure. The structure alone is public, however the name is not. And that in turn means we cannot construct this particular structure in the same way. So what do we do? Well, we have to supply a form of a constructor. And this is a public function that returns self. Uh, the whole idea is that this public constructor actually has access to those private fields. If you're wondering, it's called new only by convention. It can be called whatever you like. What else we have in here? We have a private function, get description. What you can do, however, is once again have a public function or rather a public method and that method can run the private method. We're used to it, right? This is very similar to pretty much any other language out there that is object-oriented. So this is not news, this is simple encapsulation. And that's how it looks like in Rust. If we run it, and now we have another one, which is, this is a basic drawing of constructed circle, because that's how I called it. Um, this is the name parameter. Let's move on to the next step, which is, well, it is polymorphism, but before we dive into polymorphism per se, we're gonna take a look at one more thing. Because another thing in object-oriented paradigm that would be interesting or would be important is inheritance. And Rust does not have inheritance at all, pretty much not in any way, shape or form. On the other hand, as an industry, we are moving away from inheritance because usually it's either used incorrectly or it just adds an abstraction level that is really not needed and can, can actually hurt your design, usually. Once again, asterisk here, right? What we are moving towards is not really inheritance, but rather composition. And composition, obviously, is quite simple, because that's just a struct in the struct. So this is exactly what I wanted to show in here. So what we've got is a public struct called circle, which consists of a shape, which is a private struct called inner shape, which at the moment only contains a name field, nothing else. Important part is the circle also contains radius, which is a float number. Then we've got public constructor, and we also have a private function get area to calculate that area based on the radius. We've got another structure in here, which is a square which is similar in that meaning that it also contains a private inner shape. It also contains a side or the length of the side, which is actually unsigned integer in this instance. Again, 
we've got the implementation block, we've got the public constructor, and a private get area function, which returns now an unsigned integer. We want to take a look at polymorphism. There are two approaches to polymorphism in Rust. First one is using enums, or discriminated unions as I know them. And this is exactly what we have in here. So this is an enum called shape, which consists of two options, either a circle with a subtype of circle or a square with a subtype of square. Now the idea is for that shape, we can implement public functions that we would use um, as a common thing. When we take a look at the public function draw me, it actually uses, well, the reference to self, so it's kind of like this in C sharp, and it matches on self to figure out what kind of shape it is, right? If it is a circle, then to the variable called name, we are um, assigning the shape name. The same we do with square, and even though they look perfectly the same, we cannot really merge them. However, this is where I say uh, Rust doesn't really use enums, but rather discriminated unions, because if we would add something to the shape, um, let's explore how that would go. So we've added another structure called rectangle, and we also added that option to the shape enum. Whenever you have a match on an enum, that match alone and the compiler will force you to use every option possible. And as you can see, we've got the same error in here. So yeah, those enums are a bit more powerful than your usual enums from C Sharp. You probably already noticed that get area returns a float for the circle, but for the square we are returning unsigned integer, therefore I have to uh, match the type to have that area as a float. I'm sure based on this very simple example you can already imagine an issue with this approach. So bear that in mind, even though it's very simple to reason about, it's not super flexible. All right, how do we use that? We create a circle and a square, and since both of those we can enclose in the shape, then we can have both of those in a list. And from this point on, if you have a list, you can iterate over it, go into a for each, and then just use print area and draw me. But bear in mind that print area and that draw me are actually from the shape. They are not from the circle or the square. Let's run it. This is the area of one, the other, and also this is a drawing by discriminated union of circle and of square. Lastly, let's take a look at another approach to polymorphism in Rust. And this approach is based on traits. Here you can see there are two traits that are defined. And as you can see, the trait contains only a function type. So whatever the function is accepting as parameters and whatever it is returning from the function. This looks and works similarly as interfaces in C Sharp. Also exactly as in C Sharp, this can have a default implementation. Again, we are looking at a public struct called circle, and it does contain pretty much the same kind of constructor. And now we are getting into the fun part, because we are implementing that particular trait for this particular structure. So if I were to remove that, you can already see I've got an error, which means, well, not all trait items are implemented. Here we go. So this was the, this was the implementation of get name. Similar situation to the previous example, we've got a square with a public constructor, 
Then again, we've got implementation of get name trait for that square and implementation of get area for that square. And this get area actually uses unsigned integers rather than floats. For all of this to make sense, we now have to have a public function that will use that trait. So public function draw shape actually accepts a shape which is a reference to the type that implements get name trait. The dynamic keyword is something that we'll um, cover in a second, but as you can see in here in the print area, the implementation keyword is also useful. Actually, the implementation is the default keyword. So it's used in here. We've got a circle and a square, and then we are using that print area function from the polymorphism trait module. It's really just a function that accepts both of those at the same time, thanks to that trait. The issue is you still cannot really put both of those in the same list. And that's where that dynamic keyword goes in. Because if you want to use a common list for both of those objects, you have to box them. It's not a topic for today. I just wanted to show you guys that you can actually do it. That list we can use to, well, draw the shape. And once again, draw the shape is a public function that accepts those dynamic get name implementations. It's just an extra step in here. So when we compare those two, well, I'll be honest, the discriminated union way looks better. When we go the trade route, it definitely is more versatile. You just need a function that accepts an implementation of particular trait. Thank you very much everyone. Today we've covered how Rust approaches object-oriented paradigm and we'll focus on the functional paradigm in the next episode. Hope you had some fun. And as always, we can do better as a pack. Bye. <laughs> Take number 37 probably today. It's not my day today. <laughs> Jesus. All right. This is recording. This is recording. This is moving. All right. <laughs> Now we're getting into something.